And now, let's go to God's Word with Pastor Kevin's new sermon series, The Way. Well, good morning. So good to have you and good to have, be together in worship this morning. And uh, I want you to, would you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 14. And as we go to this passage, I want to say thank you to all of our volunteers who helped us with this outreach to Mission Alante today. Uh, as maybe some of you have brought some cloth items, this is a way for us to connect in the community. Um, somewhere before Christmas, uh, we had met with the director of Mission at Alante, and this is one of our partnerships of ways that we help uh, people coming into Kansas City. Um, they're uh, surrounding this area. Uh, part of Kansas City is a place where uh, people uh, from different countries, refugees coming in, trying to find, uh, uh, find ways to live or adapt, uh, find education or school. And, and uh, they have a thrift store, and we've, we've been able to help them today uh, by giving through Mission at Alante. And we're so grateful for that and grateful for that opportunity. We're in this series uh, this morning um, that I started last week. It's only this week and next week. Uh, this week and last week and this week, talking about the ways of Jesus, the way that Jesus leads us, the way that we live our life in rhythm with what Jesus had called his disciples to do, and how different it is than the way that we live life now, and how to really understand what Jesus was saying when he invited his disciples to understand the way, or the way that, that they're, they're to different to live. Uh, when I was in college, um, my, my father had purchased a, uh, two lots, two uh, pieces of property that he had intended to, to build a townhouse on for us, for us siblings, for myself and my two sisters to live in while we went to college, hoping and believing that they would be overseas in, in, at a time when we were in school. And uh, we still had, at one point, still owned these two pieces of lot, uh, pieces of property that were located just around the quarter from Southeastern College. And it just so happened that on, this, on these lots uh, were these amazing grapefruit trees. And so I would, I would uh, when I was hungry, I would just drive around the neighborhood and uh, pull up in front of these two lots. And at that time in college, I had this Honda Accord. Um, and we were all, all my friends were in one Accord together. And uh, we, we drove, we would drive around and I would drive around to this, this lot and I would park my Honda and I would hop out and I would go and pick off some grapefruits off the grapefruit tree. There was two or three of them, beautiful, very delicious grapefruit trees. And on one particular occasion, the neighbor behind the lots had seen me uh, step out and go to pick up the grapefruits. And he came to the edge of the fence and he said, excuse me, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm, I'm getting grapefruits. And, uh, and he said, uh, he said uh, you, you, you shouldn't be on this property. And I said, well, I, I should be on this property. And, and he said, but there's somebody else that's owned it. And I said, uh, actually, it's my parents who own it. And when I said that, the argument was over. And, uh, and I proceeded by uh, pulling off the grapefruits and, and packing them into the accord and taking them back to the college with me. And I realized that when we understand the ways of Jesus, we realize that our relationship with Jesus provides an avenue or a different way of living life. And if we're not careful, just like maybe a neighbor or just like maybe an outside person or thought, we don't understand who really owns the property of our life and our soul. And something keeps us from getting into the access that God has for us. Something gets in the way. In fact, that's the title of the message this morning, Something in the Way. You see, something gets in the way. Something gets in the way of not only our, our thoughts, but something gets in the way 
as we live out our life and maybe we look back at a season in our life, a, a part of our life that, that seems to be on auto repeat and, and, and even now, even much more now, it, it seems like there are so many things that get in the way of understanding the real way of Jesus. There are, there are things that, that seem to kind of come into the way. And I want us to look, and I want us to look starting in verse 1, and I want us to look at what's happening to the disciples as we look at this passage again in a different, a different portion of this passage from last week. And the title of this message again is Something That's in the Way. Something is in the way. And start, starting in verse 1, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. This is a command that God, that Jesus gives his disciples. Now, let me just kind of give you an idea of what the context of this. In John chapter 13, in John chapter 13, 14, and all the way to 17, we see the events uncovering around the Passover. We see that, that Jesus is at the Passover table. We see that, that the disciples have been listening to Jesus, much like the celebration of the Passover and the communion that we did today. This is what's happening in John chapter 14. Jesus has uh, invited the disciples to the Passover table, and it's here at the Passover table that the disciples find out that there is some, a betrayer at the table. Jesus points out who Judas is, and Judas is exposed. It's at the same place that, that Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. And it's almost like this section or this portion, as Jesus is uh, sharing this, these moments, this is most likely this is Thursday night leading up before Jesus' cru crucifixion. So as Jesus is spending time with his disciples, he's sharing what would be the most, the last thoughts, the last most important thoughts of his life with the disciples, and he's giving them some very important principles to understand. And it's also here where after Jesus finishes washing the, the, feet, the feet of the disciples, that Peter steps up and says, Jesus, I won't betray you. And we all know that Jesus responds and says, no, Peter, by the end of the time that the, you hear the, the, the crow three times, you'll have betrayed me three times. It's here that Peter discovers his own heart. It's here that the disciples are all of a sudden, they're hearing Jesus talk about heaven. You see, John chapter 14 and, and even all the way into uh, verse 4 is where Jesus all the time in his ministry has been talking about heaven. You can even read it here. He says, if, you, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again and receive you to myself that, that where I am, there you also may be. He, he's talking about a dwelling place. He's, he's not talking about necessarily a mansion. In fact, the words here in John chapter 14 are a room. It's like, a, like an apartment. We have an apartment. It's, it's, it's a nice apartment. I want to just tell you, it's a very nice apartment. God has prepared a very nice room for you and I. He's preparing that room. And if he's been preparing it for 2,000 years, it's very nice. And, and, and the New Testament is, is overflows with passages where Jesus has been talking about heaven. And John, the gospel writer himself, as he's, he's sharing this, he then also, in, in the end, we read in Revelation where he would receive the revelation of what heaven would look like. And, and you would think that if Jesus was talking about the beauty of heaven and the excitement of heaven and they're sitting at a table and they're having this discussion, you would think that they would also have share in those same kind of excitement. But what we discover is this, is that's not what the case. Because they realize that Jesus is going to be leaving them. He's gonna be leaving their presence and they're, they're really bummed out about Jesus' leaving them. They're very upset, they're discouraged about it, so much so that we find this commandment that Jesus says right here. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus commands that. 
He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You see, for you and I, that's the same today as it was for the disciples. When, when our hearts are troubled, it actually gets in the way. When our hearts are trembling, it gets in the way. It gets in the way of what Jesus wants to accomplish. It gets in the way of of learning and following the directions that God has for us as people. And so when Jesus says to the disciples in verse 1, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. He's wanting to get their attention at the table because he's telling them that their hearts are trembling because they're afraid. They've been exposed and Peter's shameful he's ashamed that he that 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 all of this has happened their feet have been washed all of this experience is happening and then Jesus unloads and shares the, some of the most deepest richest words to his disciples as he would say and we read last week i am the way the truth and the life see it's right here in this moment when their hearts are troubled that Jesus reminds them of the way It's right here in a a moment of realizing that Jesus is going to be leaving them, that Jesus actually steps up and, and introduces and tells us them, hey, I know that you're upset, I know your hearts are troubled, but I just want to remind you, this is the way. I am the way. And when we read the Gospels, we read even when Jesus was doing his ministry on multiple occasions, he got done preaching and people didn't like the way what he said and they would actually walk away. That would be pretty shocking today if we got done preaching and part of you just walked away. You'd see that. That's how Jesus ministered. And Jesus here, as he's talking to disciples, he says, he gives this command. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. He says, believe in God and believe also in me. I think in this very verse, in verse 1, there is such a deep connection to our spirit and to our soul today. Because we, at times, allow things to get into the, in the way. We allow our troubled hearts to get in the way. We allow our troubled thinking, our troubled thoughts to get into the way. And, and instead, of, instead of allowing uh, us ourselves to get into the way, something else makes its way in our way. Something else captures our attention. Something else leads our heart. Something else troubles it. And that something else is something else that is in the way. Today, I want to ask you that question, what is it that's in the way? What is it that that may be that very thing, that something, that very element that may be in the way of understanding what Jesus' way really is? And then Jesus then begins to teach because, as you remember, uh, as we talked about it last week, Thomas himself asked the question. In fact, there was two disciples. There was Thomas, and then the second one we want to look at today was Philip. Thomas... Thomas was the one we know very well, Doubting Thomas. And we remember the question from last week. He said he, said, he kind of was the brave one. He was the one that had the greatest question mark in his thinking. He said to Jesus, he said, if you're going to leave, how are we going to follow you, Jesus? If you're going to leave the room, how are we going to know which way to go? Show us the way. Show us how to get there, Jesus. And then Jesus then tells Thomas, I am the way. But look with me in verse 7, because I want to look at three aspects of how to understand this way of getting things out of the way and understanding what Jesus was trying to communicate. Because when we try to understand, when we understand what Jesus is trying to say, then ultimately things move. They move out of the way, and we begin to move in His way. Look with me in verse 7. He says, if you had known me, now that word known Notice that you can underline if you if he had if you had known me because because uh, he's responding to Thomas, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Now, notice that word known is mentioned several times in that in that verse. 
And that leads us to our first point, point of understanding is this, is that, that Jesus is talking about the person. He's talking about the person, and we know this, is that, it, that the person of Jesus or the person uh, of Jesus gives way to the knowledge of God. The person of Jesus gives way to the knowledge of who God is. Because Jesus said it this way. He says, if you know me. Now he's responding to Thomas. He says, Thomas, if you know me, you will also know the Father because the Father and I are the one. He, he's making this same comparison. If you know Jesus, you know God. And whether we realize it or not, this is, Jesus says this is the only way. And, and some people may say this is very closed-minded. Well, can I tell you, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said that, that narrow is the, is the way. That, that broad is the way to, that opens the doors to other things. But he says, narrow is the way. And Jesus is saying that if you know him, if you know me, you also know the Father. You also know God. You see, in French, there's, there's two words for the word know. We only have one word. We only have one word. But in French, it just so happens... When I was thinking about this, I flipped, flipped over into the French part of my thinking, my brain. I won't do that for you, just, just for, I'll be gracious this morning. But there's, a, there's a, two words in French, and both of those words have the, same, uh, have the same meaning, but they mean a little bit differently. One word in French that we use for the word know means to know about. Like, for example... Just a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, visiting, and, and Luciana and I were driving south on South Oak, and we saw a car show, much like the car show that we have here in a parking lot, and a good friend of ours, Max Burke, who's here today, Max Burke, we saw him in the parking lot. We pulled in really quickly and parked our car, and Luciana wanted to go and look at all of the cars, and I know about cars, but I don't know cars. Now, Max knows cars. And I stepped outside of our car, and I, and I would walk, and, and Luciana was, was as any a seven-year-old, traveling and just taking pictures of every different car. And I would stop, and, and I'd look at a car, and I'd say, I'd say, Max, what is this about this car? And he would go through the whole details of the engine, the year it was made, how it was made, how many of them were made, uh, and how many, how many, maybe knowing how many were made at a certain time, and, and maybe even the owner of the car, and how they had been, either they had been to Northland Cathedral in, in one of our car shows, and he, he knows about cars. Now, if you ask me about a car, I'm just going to tell you, this is how you start it, and there's the engine. That's about it. I can tell you if it's got six or eight cylinders or four. But, but there's a difference between knowing about something and knowing it intimately and knowing it everything and Jesus is using the words here he's using these words he says if you know Jesus can I tell you there is no other time more precious than right now to know Jesus there's no other more more intimate time for us to begin to know Jesus more intimately and personally because what Jesus is saying is here is that the person of Jesus gives way to the knowledge of God. Jesus becomes the the becomes the the manual to knowing about God. Jesus himself becomes the way of understanding and Jesus is saying this to uh, to uh, to, to Thomas and to the disciples, he's saying, if you know me, then you'll know the Father, you'll know him. You see, the more we know Jesus, the more we know God. The more we know who Jesus is, the more we experience that. You see, it's the person of Jesus that gives way to the knowledge of God. The second thing that we understand is we find as Jesus is talking to, uh, to Philip here, uh, as Philip then begins to ask Jesus, he says, he says, Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. And is it enough for us? And is it enough for us? And then Jesus answered him, have I, not, have I not been so long with you? You see, Philip had been called by Jesus. He was one of the disciples. Philip himself 
had spent years with Jesus watching miracles happen. And here's almost, almost like a, 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 a rebuke because he says to Philip, Philip, don't you know me? Don't you know me? Don't, don't you know the, who I am? And because I've, I've been, been ministering with you, he says, he says, and why do you ask, show us the Father? He says, you've seen, you've been walking with me. And, and what more, more reasonable time in a time like now when, when our hearts are trembling and Jesus would say, do not let your hearts be troubled. I, 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 people send me, uh, they send me video clips and news and everything else of what's happening, of go, what's going on. And my, my first response is, do not let your hearts be troubled because we know Jesus. We know Jesus, we know who he is, we know the sovereignty of who he is, that he is the, he's not only fully man and fully capable, but he's also fully God. And if we know who Jesus is, then we know the Father and we know what's waiting for us. We know that heaven is in store. We know that there's a room. We know that there's something ahead of us and we just have to know who Jesus is. And, and that should be our focus. That needs to be our primary focus. Not only did he say knowing, but look at what Jesus says because it's in these words. It's what he's telling Philip that tells, helps us understand our own troubled heart. Look with me in the following verses. It's verse, in, verse, uh, in verse 11. He says, believe me, verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe, believe because of the works themselves. Notice how he, he brings attention to the works. He uses the works. And then in verse 12, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now, this is where Jesus begins to turn the table a little bit. Because we not only understand that the person of Jesus gives way to the knowledge of Jesus, but secondly, we understand that the power of Jesus, the power of Jesus gives way to the purpose of God. The power of Jesus gives way to the purpose of God. Jesus is telling Philip, he's saying, listen, Philip, if you understand, you've understand my works and my works are powerful. Jesus was demonstrating. He had, he had just recently, prior to this, Lazarus had been raised from the dead. People had been healed, sick, blind people were seeing. And he's saying, Philip, don't you recognize, don't you see the works that have, been, that have been shown to you. And then he says this, and he says, and these works will also be, you will also do them. Think about that. How do you, how do you compare to the works of Jesus? Jesus said, you're gonna do it as well. The power of God through Jesus, working through you, will also give you and I, the church of Jesus Christ, the ability to do his purpose and do his will. And I think there's these moments in these, these months and these times are defining moments for us as a church, not just as Northland Cathedral, but the church as a whole, to be the church of Jesus Christ, to be the church and to operate in the power that he's given us. And if Jesus is telling Philip, he says, listen, Philip, I know that your heart's troubled. I know that you're experiencing the hardship of me not being with you. I know this, but he says, just believe in the person and believe in the power because in the power of Jesus gives way to the purpose of God. And God has a divine purpose for you and I, and he's called us to it. He's called us to that divine purpose. That's how Jesus said it. He said, he says, if you believe in me, uh, he says, believe also in, in the works, in the, in the works that he wants to accomplish. And, and, he, and, and if you continue, he says, the greater works that these he will do, and he's saying, because, because I go to the Father, he says, because I'm gonna leave you, I'm gonna do some powerful things. Can I tell you that I believe the day of the return of Christ is getting closer and closer? And in and knowing that and realizing that, 
Scripture tells us that there is a preparation, that there is an outpouring, that there's a work for us to do. And that being the case, then let's get our hearts ready. Let's, get, let's recognize the power of God. Let's, let's begin to, to thank God for the power that he gives to us and, and that working power. And This is how it worked for Philip because Philip as a disciple at that moment sitting at the table was scared because Jesus was leaving and he was concerned about where his, his, his savior was gonna go. But if you turn with me and you look with me in Acts chapter eight, you can notice that what happens to Philip because Philip later after, after after the day of Pentecost, Philip, with, along with the other disciples, become, become powerhouses of, of evangelists. And Philip's no longer the disciple. He's now Philip the evangelist. And we read it in chapter 8 and verses 26 and following. It says, but an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to, to Gaza. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch and a court official of, Can of Candace. Now, I don't know if you know this, but my sister's name is Candace. We just call her Candy. But here's what, well, here's what happened to Philip, is that days later, months, just momentary months after Jesus would say this, the power of God rested on Philip's life, and he hears, and hears the voice of an angel, and then he gets up, and he even tells us that he ran ahead, and he witnessed to, to an Ethiopian eunuch who then went to Ethiopia, and then the gospel as we know it today reached Ethiopia because of a man of a disciple called Philip who was questioning and wondering on the power of God. So just maybe there is, an, there is a calling, there's something that God is calling you to do when you rest on the power of Jesus because the power of Jesus gives us the way to the purpose of God. There is purpose that God has to fulfill for us. Tonight, I am, I'm truly excited about our annual business meeting. Most pastors, you know, annual business meetings, every year I look with anticipation to share wonderful things that God is ha has done for us and God is doing in us and preparing us for the future. And as we do that, we do that with the power of God and the person of God and, and the Holy Spirit working in our life. And we're committed to that. And when we are committed to that, God shows up. And lastly, this morning, as we look at this, how do we move and how do we get something that's in the way, whatever it's in the way, that troubling heart, that, that troubling thought or those things that, that seem to make its way into our heart, how do, we, how do we move those things out of the way? And Jesus shows us very plainly and very clearly. He says in verse 12, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And verse 13, whenever you ask in my name, whatever you ask, asking is praying. Asking is praying. What, what Jesus is saying, he says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I think that this is the boldest way to encourage his disciples to step out in faith. Because you see, when, when we know Jesus and we know the heart of Jesus, our prayers reflect it. When we know the heart of Jesus, we know the heart of the Father, we can pray with boldness, we can pray in the name of Jesus, not that the name of Jesus is some tool that we use to, to, to maneuver God, but because when you know the name of Jesus, you can also pray in that name, believing that the will of God is in, in line with your knowledge of who he is, with the power, and knowing all of that, Jesus says, I will do it.
So maybe there are prayers that have not been prayed yet. Maybe there are moments of prayers where we wait in prayer prayer and asking and say, Lord, that we know that, that the prayer in Jesus gives way to the provision of God and that there are no other provisions of things that God wants to do in this city, in our country, in our world as God uses us as we pray and we say, God, I want to see you you do something. I love this idea and I shared it in, in thinking about this passage. I was thinking about the word waiting because over and over again, the idea of waiting is, 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 is equal, is, is brought together with the idea of prayer. And when we wait before God and we wait in prayer, the, the idea of waiting is somebody bringing something to us. How many of you like it when your spouse brings something to you? Tarina just raised her hand. <laughs> we like it when somebody brings something to us. And yet, yet we traditionally, we think that if we pray and we activate and we work, that we're supposed to work to achieve the purpose of God. But what if while we're waiting, God just wants to bring it to us? God wants to reveal something to us while we're waiting and while we pray because prayer in Jesus gives way. Now notice in all three of these statements this morning, the word way shows up. The way. It gives way. Jesus is the one who actually gives the way. And when we realize how he gives way, he gives way through his person, he gives way through his power, he gives way through prayer, and when we are actively doing these things, the troubled heart, the command that Jesus gave us, that he gave the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled, all of a sudden the heart, our troubled hearts becomes quiet. And we experience the peace of God and the presence of God. Just take a moment in quietness this morning as a church. Just begin to thank God for his presence. Thanks, thank God for his, the person of who he is. Would you just gently just thank God for, who, for his son, for Jesus? Lord, we wait for you. We wait for you. Nothing more important than waiting for you. you just stand with me this morning and when Jesus gave that command he said believe in God and believe also in me believe in God believe also in me the person the power and the prayer, all things that he has given us, all things that we have access to.
And we just thank God this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your divine word that you have given us through John. Lord, through your word that has been spoken to us. And I ask you, Lord, that this week that, that our hearts would be settled, that our spirits would be at tune with you, that we would come to know you more. We'd come to rely upon your power that nothing would get in the way. Whatever is in the way, whatever that something is, Lord, may, may it be moved in the name of Jesus. May our hearts be settled on you. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Can we sing this in closing? Jesus Messiah. for being here today. We're so glad that you come to join us. And those that have joined us in, in online in the overflow, we're glad to see you here this morning. We pray that you have a wonderful rest of your week and we'll see you tonight.